All right, good evening. We're glad all of you can be here tonight, and glad you can join us online as well. We're going to go ahead and start off a song with a song tonight, Faith is the Victory. And if you would stand with me, please, we'll sing this song, and we'll do it a cappella tonight. Our pianist is not able to be here, nor our organist, but we'll go ahead and sing, and uh, we'll just go ahead. This song is a great song, so we'll probably sing the whole song here. All right, you guys ready to sing with us tonight? All right, let me hear you sing out. Here we go on that first verse. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. And it is. Well, at this time, we'll turn it over to Pastor Mays. Thank you, Brother Ben. It's good to be here. And some of you have wondered about my condition. Those of you watching know that I did have a heart attack last Friday, and, and uh, they got me out and uh, Sunday night. They put a stent in me, said it was a severe heart attack, but because they got right at it, as soon as it, almost as soon as it happened, they uh, said it was a small heart attack. So I don't know how much damage uh, was done, if any, but praise the Lord that he's always in control. And I uh, want to thank you for watching uh, me and uh, so forth, we want, uh, want uh, praying for me, should I say, uh, praying for me, and, and uh, God's been very good. Uh, I came back home yesterday, and some of you know I have AFib, so some of that kicked in yesterday, and I was running around just really weary. Uh, when, that, when that happens, it just wears me out, and you, you can't understand how much that wears me out until uh, you see that. But anyway, we're glad you're here. We also... I uh, want to just mention that the Buck family has, a, has had a death, and so all of them are out in West Virginia right now. And uh, we want to be in prayer for them. As this, I, I can't remember whose, whose family member died. Was it hers? Uh, Andre's grandmother. Andre's grandmother, okay. So uh, they had to go somewhere out in the state of West Virginia. And uh, you know what that means. You have to go up and down hills. 
Uh, hill, that's a hilly state, isn't it? But anyway, just pray for uh, Andre's family, and uh, <coughs> he, uh, they, they're usually here on Wednesday night. We appreciate their faithfulness. They come a pretty good distance just to get here, so uh, thank you for that. And then tonight we have uh, Sandy Adolph, her husband, passed away this morning. It's almost unbelievable that she's here tonight, but I commend you for that. And boy, just it's a good testimony that when uh, uh, things go sour in a person's life, you, you still serve the Lord, and we trust that uh, you will pray for uh, them. He's with the Lord. He was one of those kind of guys that was kind of an ornery fella. And uh, I remember Sandy just, just heavy hearted about praying for him that he would give his heart and his life to Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I don't have the exact date as to when he got saved, but, but uh, I know Brother Ben took him in the back room and said that uh, he prayed a beautiful prayer asking Christ to come into his heart and his life. And uh, you say, what does that mean now? Well, that means he's with the Lord. So praise God. You know, we sorrow not as others that have no hope. And so uh, it's, a, it's a joy to have you. And, and she even brought a couple friends with her. LaVon, it's good to have you. And you have to help me with your name again. Cindy? Cindy? Oh, that's an easy name. I should remember that. Cindy. I don't guess I, I don't remember catching that name when I was introduced and uh, going around shaking hands. So good to have Cindy with us. And, and uh, San, they said they were friends of Sandy. So praise the Lord for that. All right. Well, let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer and lift these uh, particular ones up in prayer. And, and uh, certainly ask. I want to mention also Wes Morgan's brother, uh, brother-in-law, Larry, passed away too. So a lot, of, a lot of things going on right now. Of course, uh, Wes's wife passed away not too long ago. And the funeral's yet to happen. So anyway, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your blessings and Lord for all that you do for us. You, you uh, <clears throat> have met every need. You heard our every cry. Our, our prayers are lifted up before you. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the people who have held me up in prayer. I just believe that my being here right now is an answer to those prayers. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that uh, we would use the time that you've blessed us with, with great wisdom. And Lord, to, to do what needs to be done. Lord, we pray for our, uh, these dear loved ones that have had sorrows brought into their life. We, I think about the Buck family and ask God that you would really bring uh, tenderness and comfort. And I pray that uh, the testimony of, of Andre and his family would stand uh, above everything and, and tell people that Christ is the answer and the solution to whatever loneliness is found in their lives. We pray that you give them strength and help in this hour. We pray also, Lord, for the uh, Adolf family. And Lord, how dreadful it is to lose anybody. And, and Lord, as we have the funeral, I pray that you would give us great wisdom and understanding of what needs to be done. We, we commit them into your care and ask God that that the peace that passes all understanding would be theirs. And Lord, that those that do not sense and understand what that means, that they would come to a knowledge and understanding of Christ and that they would trust you as their Lord, as their Savior, as did Wayne. We pray your blessings on the uh, Clark family and certainly the uh, uh, Morgan family and the heartaches that they're going through. And Lord, pray that we can know how to help them best and and Lord, I pray that you just give them peace and help. Lord, a lot of people are having other issues going on in their lives. So Lord, we commit them into your care. And Lord, just pray that you would bless our study tonight in God's word and all that's done and said would be to your honor and to your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All righty. I'm going to slide over here, Miss Mays, and you can be seated or dismissed as the case might be. And... Uh, if you can kind of get it over here and zoom in this way. Uh, good to have these boys and girls here. We've got a number of them that are that uh, rode the bus tonight, so thank you for coming in on the bus. We do have uh, bus ministry. It's actually out into the Lothian area. If you are interested in uh, putting children on a bus and you live in that area, 
And really, if you live in the deal area, too, we can probably work that all out and help children get to church and maybe some moms and dads, too. Maybe some grandmas and grandpas and maybe some great grandmas and grandpas if you can, if you can uh, uh, climb the steps. So, amen. So, well, I'm going to take you to the book of Proverbs again tonight. We studied, we, we took off on this study. And uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> and let me say one other thing before I get into this. I want to thank Brother Ben for jumping into the saddle here, uh, really without hardly any notice at all. And he did a good job. I listened to him in the hospital room. You can do that. You know, do you know that? If you got, uh, if you got a computer or something like that, that uh, maybe your smartphone. That's what I used. And uh, and you know, he looks better when he's small. You know, <laughs> uh, not really. He looks great anyway. Amen. But uh, did a good job, and I I appreciate him and appreciate. Uh, the labor. He's also a kindergarten teacher, which is very demanding. Teachers are in high demand today. I remember him saying that uh, that uh, if you quit, we've got somebody lined up to take your place. No, they don't. <laughs> I think he can tell. Hey, I think I need a raise and get it, you know. But uh, anyway, pray for him. He goes all the way to Arlington, Virginia, to to teach, and he's at one of those schools that they. You got to have a lottery to get into, you know. What do they call that kind of a school? A lottery school. <laughs> Sounds like a gamble to me, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, we uh, uh, we appreciate him, and he's a great teacher. I'm so honored that he's a part of this ministry, and I don't know, uh, I don't know uh, how whether you appreciate what he does, like uh, he needs to be appreciated, and and so forth. Uh, but thank you, Brother Ben, for all you did, and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll look forward to hearing them again uh, real soon. Well, we're in uh, Proverbs chapter one tonight. I mentioned uh, that we introduced Proverbs last week, and really a couple weeks ago, and then uh, we took off on on uh, some of the things that uh, Solomon was trying to bring out. Uh, this is a book written. Uh, in part, at least uh, largely, by King Solomon. And uh, King Solomon was the son of, D of King David, and of course David was a righteous, godly king. In fact, the Bible says that he was a man after uh, God's own heart. And so there's uh, so much that can be said and, and uh, done uh, just thinking about some of the things that he did. We mentioned that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that uh, he... Uh, wanted to, uh, in the salutation and so forth, he gave the title of the book. And, of course, we mentioned that it is the book of Proverbs. And it just uh, mentioned, we mentioned that there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. And so if you really want to get into that, you can read one chapter a day in a 31-day month. February, you kind of come a little short, I'm afraid. But, but you can get into that and uh, apply these things. Now, if you're going to read Proverbs, it's not going to do you much good to just read it and skip it, you know, just and not think about it. You need to really dissect it, and that's kind of really what we have been doing here as we have uh, gone through this. And uh, we mentioned something about the purpose of Proverbs. It was to know wisdom. Boy, if there's something we need in our world today, it's wisdom, isn't it? We need to know wisdom, and we need to know how to use it. And, uh, <clears throat> and the Bible uh, tells us that uh, there's uh, kind of there's really two kinds of wisdom. There's the worldly wisdom. That's not really good, is it? Uh, you know, what seems right is not always right. And uh, then there's the spiritual wisdom or the godly wisdom. And uh, and so we need to have the <coughs> wisdom to know what the difference is. And so uh, we mentioned over in First Corinthians one twenty four says, "But woe unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks." Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. But of him uh, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. So uh, what we need, according to uh, verse 2, is to know the instruction, to perceive understanding. This is kind of what he's uh, point, pointing out. Well, let's skip down there to verse number 7. And uh, this is where we kind of found the motto of the book of Proverbs. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning 
of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the beginning, uh, the Bible says the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I have people say, I'm not afraid of God. Well, they don't have much wisdom either. You know, that's kind of what it says. And, uh, and so he, we, we spoke about this motto as being uh, something that uh, a loss, uh, the difference between the lost and the saved person, the uh, wise and the foolish person. We mentioned that, that uh, uh, there are basically three classes of people that are mentioned in this, this verse. One is the fool, the other is the simple, and certainly the scorner. And this is kind of all brought into the different kinds of people. There's a lot of fools in our world, aren't there? Uh, people that are unwise, people who are sluggish in their thinking, who are dense, maybe uh, careless and self-satisfied. Uh, we mentioned the man Nabal over in 1 Samuel chapter 25, and, and here's a man, uh, his name meant fool. <laughs> uh, could you imagine some parent naming their son fool? You know, that's kind of really what that was. And, and uh, he, was, he was one of these people that mocked sin, and he was one of these people that... Uh, uh, he did not have favor of, the, of those that were around him. Even his own wife didn't really have any respect for him. And so, uh, anyway, uh, he caused grief to, to David. But uh, then there's a the simple, the simple person. He's the person who believes about everything and anything anybody tells him. Uh, I find people that, that don't know good from bad. You've got to tell them. You know, it's not that they want to do wrong. It's just that they... Uh, they just don't know the difference. Say, I don't see anything wrong. They ever hear anybody say something like that? I don't see anything wrong with you know whatever they want to do, and uh, what that means is that they're that they're not prudent. They don't understand things. Uh, Proverbs fourteen fifteen says, "The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well in, uh, to his going." Uh, sometimes we get phone calls as you as I do, and they're on the other line. You got to determine. Okay, is this a real, uh, genuine call, or is this going to be a scam? You know, and so because of that, we begin to understand a little bit of the difference between, uh, you know, what's right, what's wrong. Uh, wisdom tells you, uh, through a lot of times through past experience, what what is right, what is not right. Right, and so the simple man, uh, he is led by others. He's not. He doesn't think for himself. He's a uh, he is a mimicker, if you want to call him that. If he, if he comes up with anything original, it's not original. It's usually mimicked and uh, so forth. And he's the one that quotes everybody else. He says, I want to be different from everybody else. And in trying to do that, he's exactly like everybody else. You know, he, he thinks he's doing something uh, 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 different. Uh, Proverbs 22, verse 3 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And I, I think about this person. A lot of simple people have died, gone to devil's hell. Uh, and a simple person doesn't need to do that. My job as a pastor is to try to make people wise. Take the people that don't understand, that, that are ignorant, and so forth. Isn't that what Jesus did when he fed the 5,000 and he taught the multitudes on the Sermon on the Mount and so forth? He was taking simple people and trying to instruct them. And, you know, if the, the truth of the matter is, is I think we are all simple at some point in time in our life. So uh, the person that's wise is going to be the person going to seek after wisdom and try to get it. The third person we mentioned was a scorner. And uh, uh, Proverbs 14, 6 says, A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Uh, a, a scorner mocks wis the wisdom of God because... It's really way above him. He, he doesn't understand things, even though he doesn't want to admit it. And he's the fellow that, he's the guy that kind of acts like, well, I know everything, and you can't teach me anything. And so everything that you do is a little bit different. Uh, he's going to scorn it. And uh, he, you know, you know what, uh, a per, you know, in our world, we kind of have it set up. So, uh, you know, to get ahead, you got to step on somebody else. And that's the scorner that does that. He's the one that says, what are you doing it like that for? You know, and he's, he's hateful, he's mean, he's, he's uh, haughty. Uh, Proverbs 21, 24 says, proud and, haughty, uh, proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. Uh, the word uh, 
for the, the word in Hebrew for the word scorner literally means to make a mouth. Uh, here's here you know, like this. <laughs> you know, just that, that that look, you know. You ever have somebody roll their eyes, that kind of thing? And they silently scorn you, you know. Uh, I had I, I've had people that have done that from the pew. Uh, I've, I've had people, <laughs> just anything. I try not to look at them too much when I'm preaching because that can get into my head. Uh, so we spoke about the scorner, and the result of the scorner is this, is he's going to one day be judged. Uh, in Proverbs 19, verse 25, it says, Smite the scorner, and the simple will beware, and reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. Now, sometimes there's some scorners I would like to smite. I want you to know that. They, they haven't got their, their ducks lined up. And all, they can't find anything right. I had somebody call me not very long ago, and they, uh, he said, well, I got this thing, that thing. I said, here's, here's what you need to do. And I don't even know the fellow. You know, he called me from Baltimore, and uh, he says, I got this problem, got this problem, got that problem. I don't even know how he got, me, got my number, but he called me, and we talked for, I don't know, 40, 50 minutes. And uh, he uh, I said, well, you called me for an answer. I'm giving you an answer. But he wouldn't take it. You know why? He was a scorner. He, uh, he says, uh, I don't think this can happen. And it's over like this. So we, we spoke about the scorner. And then there's the wise man. The difference between a wise man and a foolish man is uh, determined by how a person relates first to God in salvation. I think a person needs to be saved to really understand what spiritual wisdom is. And then, of course, the wisdom that we have to have in order to get along in the world. The whole book of Proverbs is telling us, as Christians, how we can get along with the rest of the world. It's, a, it's almost like a rule book. If you, can master, if you can master the book of Proverbs, you'll be able to handle the scorners and the simple and all the other things that come down, to, uh, the, down the pike. And, of course, uh, Proverbs tells you what's wise, how to handle your money, how to get along in your marriage, how to raise your children, uh, what to do with uh, uh, addictions and things of this nature. These are things that, that uh, we need to know how to get along with and, and get, get by with. Uh, sadly, the world has its own wisdom. Well, let's go see the psychologists. I'm not against psychology by any sense of the word, but let's go see them and let's get our problems all solved by uh, seeing him or her, as the case might be. The only problem is a lot of those psychologists got problems themselves that are a lot of times bigger than the problems that you're going to bring to them. You know, so, and, and they don't know how to handle their problems, but the Word of God is, it sure does guide us right, and if you follow it, it will be a solution, and uh, it is a, is a wise man that will listen. Proverbs 1, 5 that we read there says, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Uh, so he listens to, to uh, instruction. He obeys what he hears. We said uh, Proverbs 10, 8, the wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Uh, he's, he stores up what he learns. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Proverbs 10, 14. Uh, he wins others to God. You know, if you're going to have, uh, in the Bible, the wisdom is personified. Uh, and I'm saying the Bible. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified. What do you mean by that? It's, it's, he, God will say wisdom, and it will refer to wisdom in a feminine gender. You know, it says, she hath, you know, and this and that. We'll say more about that as we get in there. But, but it's personified. And, and so, uh, you know, it, 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 it acts like a person in that sense. Uh, and then he stores up what he learns. I think I said that. He wins others to God, and, you know, if, if you have something that's good, you want to tell other people about it. In fact, you're selfish if you don't. You, you want to share this with people. Uh, and then he flees from sin. Proverbs 14, 16 says, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. Uh, he runs from sin. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, he watches his tongue. You ever know somebody doesn't know how to keep their tongue in check? You know, you, you, somebody just goes on, they just, they blab everything they know and say things, and then later on they're eating crow because of it and so forth. The Bible says, the heart of the wise teaches his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. 
Now, we're going to get down there to verse 8, and uh, this is where we kind of left off. He says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Now, tonight what I have done is I, uh, I've, I've just said there, there's a father-son relationship that is here. It's precious. It's really good. And you see that he starts off by saying, my son. Uh, there in verse 8, he says, my son. In verse 10, his sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Down in verse 15, he says, my son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. And 15 times between chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 7, you see the word, my son. And if you want to go through the rest of the book, I believe it was 23 times that you see the word, my son, uh, that is uh, mentioned later on in the end of the book of Proverbs. And so uh, here's what you've got. You've got a picture of a father trying to instruct his son. Boy, that's a good thing to do. Some daddies need to get a hold of their boys and their children and try to instruct them to do what's right and so forth. It doesn't mean everybody listens. In fact, uh, in this case, you've got, a, you've got my son. And, of course, the son, the only son that we have named by uh, of Solomon, and I have an idea, he had a lot of them, but uh, he had one son that was named, and that was because he became the king of, of, uh, of uh, Israel, uh, or of Judah, actually. Uh, his name was Rehoboam. And so you look at him and you say, Rehoboam, uh, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And if you do this, this is what's going to happen. If you don't do this, this is what the consequence. And you've got that kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a back and forth sort of thing there. Now, if you look at Rehoboam's life, you're going to say, boy, that guy was, was an idiot. He didn't listen to his daddy. You know, I think a lot of the things that Rehoboam did is, he heard his dad. His dad gave wonderful advice. But uh, in the later part of his life, dad was not a very good dad. Uh, understand that, that uh, he had uh, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Uh, he introduced all these people from foreign wives that he would marry, I think, perhaps for political reasons. And when he brought them into, the, into his life, they, they brought with them their gods and their worship ideas and so forth. And it caused Solomon to stumble and to fall. And so he did some things that he shouldn't do. You say, how do I know that? Well, you look at Rehoboam's life and he did exactly what his dad did, not what he said. And you know, that's a big problem today. We, we need to teach by word the things that we uh, go through in our lives to our children uh, so that they'll uh, understand. But you know, it's it's just as important to walk the walk that we teach our children to walk. Now, if I told you it was wrong to drink and get drunk and sober like that, you would respect that. You'd say, amen, preacher, that's right. But you know what you'd also do? If you saw me walk in one of these ditches and had a brown bag and staggering all over the place and, and uh, slurring my speech and so forth like that, suddenly you would begin to doubt what I'm already preaching about. You would say, preacher, uh, I'm not listening to you anymore because what you're saying and what you're doing is two different things. And you know what I think in our society today is that we've got the exact same problem. Parents teaching their kids with their mouth what they should teach them, but their lives are not backing it up. Uh, you know, the, the, the dad telling his, uh, the dad or the mother telling his or her uh, son, uh, don't be drinking while they got a cocktail in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and, and a, a foul language coming out of their mouth. Uh, the children don't, ex don't, don't uh, respect that. Uh, I, do you remember that story that uh, Ad maybe way back when? When we had a, uh, when, amen, you just go right ahead. I, we, we should have you a cup of, uh, uh, there's, there is a bottle of water back there. Maybe I'll get Brother Ben to get you one if you want it. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, don't like people to suffer. They suffer enough. Listen to me, don't they? And, uh, but uh, do you remember that uh, story? Uh, that it was an ad on the television. It was a, I think it was a black and white. This back in black and white days when uh, television wasn't in color anyway. And... Uh, 
Dad uh, is washing his car, and the little boy's out there. He's got his sponge, and he's helping Dad wash the car because Dad's doing it. He's going to do it. And, and uh, he, I don't know, picked up something. He did, did things right, and he, he was just trying to be a blessing uh, and do what his dad did. And our kids will imitate us. And then Dad, uh, he takes a breather, and he sits down by the tree, and he, and he throws down there a, uh, wow, look at this. I even get one. Thank you. And uh, that, amen. There you go. How about that, man? See, you come to church, you get water. Amen. And uh, so uh, uh, we. Uh, so anyway, I remember them coming up there, and the little boy, the dad was reaching for the cigarettes down by the tree, and he lit one up, and. Little boy's looking at dad, and he reaches over there for the same cigarettes. Remember that? Bad example, bad example. And I wonder how many times we've hurt our children uh, by giving them a bad example. So, so we're going to look here tonight at uh, this passage. Uh, uh, from this point until Proverbs chapter 9, verse 18, you see a father's and his son's relationship is drawn here. Uh, certainly Solomon was concerned that his son, uh, which was, I think, possibly Rehoboam, according to 1 Kings 11, verse 43, uh, he, could, he wanted him to achieve the greatness and the wisdom that maybe he had, or at least some of it, that is mentioned, I think, throughout these chapters that are in this passage. It's a picture of a, of a wise father uh, who takes his son and he counsels him about how to succeed in life. I like... I, I like, to, I like to make wise decisions. But the thing is, is I like to make decisions that are wise. And uh, if I can learn from other people uh, the things that, that, uh, uh, that, I mean, if they, can learn, if they can learn from me, or if I can learn from them, then I don't have to repeat the same mistakes, you see, that they did. Uh, wisdom, boy, that's, a, that's a, a, great, a great thing. In fact, I think wisdom is included a person that knows how to uh, do things right and so he, he wisely, uh, he can make money, that person can have a good relationship in his home, that person has a, has a uh, sweetness about uh, his fellowship and so forth, and uh, wow, that's, that's so much better. Amen. You got a bottle of water there. Amen. We're going to fix you right, girl. Yeah. Uh, well... At any rate, uh, we want you to be comfortable, especially people that are, haven't been here before. We want to make them feel, we say we've got a warm and friendly church, and, and uh, so there you go. That's uh, the start right there. Amen. So uh, he, he, one of the things that he tells us now is uh, he, he says, uh, my son, so you got the idea that it's a father speaking to his son, and uh, he gives uh, he gives his son advice, and I think these are good things. The first thing he says there in verse 8, he says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Now, he says, obey your parents. Uh, obey their instructions, uh, so forth. Uh, both the mother and the father are both listed here, and... Uh, it's interesting that he, he starts off, if the, the very first thing he says, I want you to do is I want you to uh, honor your parents. I want to do that. And I, I sit here and I think, you know, if you study the, uh, the Ten Commandments, you got the relationship that you have with God, you know, don't no idols and don't bow down and, you know, all that. And uh, keep the Sabbath. Uh, there are four commandments there. The fifth commandment, guess what that is? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days on earth may be long. He didn't start off with murder. He didn't start off with lying. He didn't start off with uh, adultery or covetousness. He starts off with, with uh, uh, obedience to parents. I just think that if we can teach our children, if our children will learn to be obedient to their parents, uh, that, that, it, that's a great thing. I had a, uh, a child one time, he was, uh, disobeyed his mother. He says he wasn't going to do something. And I caught him later. I said, you know, that's you, you probably don't want to live a very long time, do you? And uh, he, he wasn't re really uh, 
uh, quite, he didn't know what to take of that, you know. And uh, I said, you don't want to live very long, do you? And uh, I said, you need to obey your parents. The Bible says in the first commandment there to people, it says, honor thy father and thy, and thy mother that thy days may be long on the earth. I want to live a while, amen? Now, I've probably lived about as long as I'm going to live, but, but uh, I mean, I think I've lived a pretty good life and so forth. And sometimes we, we think about a long life as being a good life. Sometimes long life can be a miserable life, you know? Uh, Benjamin Franklin said, a lot of people die at 25 and aren't buried until they're 75, you know. Uh, the idea is that they, they're miserable all that time. I'd like, to, I'd like to think that I can look back over my life and I said, I've had a good life. God's been kind to me and so forth. But you know what I think I have to credit that to? My obedience to my parents. My mom's, my mom and my father, they, uh, they had their problems and so forth. But when they said, do this or do that, I was out there doing it. Didn't always want to do it. One of the things that we had out in our home in Virginia was we raised potatoes. And guess who got to dig them up? You know, that wasn't my favorite thing to do. I started out being a ditch digger, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, but here's the thing. Uh, I live long, I've lived long. Now, I can tell you some people, I can name names right now, people who did not honor their parents that are in the graveyard right now. And I'm talking about 30 and 40 years old. They die. Uh, it's worth it to honor the Lord. But isn't it interesting? The Lord didn't start out uh, start off with uh, "Thou shalt not kill" or "Thou shalt not, you know, steal" and so forth like this. He didn't start off with that. He started off with honoring your parents. I'm trying to tell you that the probably one of the most important things you'll ever do is to learn the value of honoring your parents. Now. Uh, you're the parents now, and I'm not talking to the kids. The kids need to hear this, Ben, so make sure they get that message. But uh, uh, there's nothing really more important that I think we need to do than to teach that our kids need to honor their parents. Uh, it's, it's listed among the great... Uh, uh, it's, disobedience to parents is mentioned in the Scriptures is listed among all those other sins that are really a great reproach. For instance, in Romans 1.30, it, it speaks about backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things. And then he says, disobedient to parents. You know? Uh, first, uh, Second Timothy 3, verse 2 says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. How about that? Disobedience to parents is listed among some of the most grievous of sins that we have in our society. So I, I, I want to just tell you something. Uh, here's what you need to do. Uh, number one, be, a, be good examples. To have success in life, a, a, a relationship has to exist, a proper relationship has to exist between children and their parents. Parents, uh, let me tell you, uh, we're the parents. We've got to be moral. We've got to be upright. We, our children need to see that in us. You know what I find? I, I find a lot of, of parents that are not moral, but they don't want their kids to know that they're not moral. So, uh, so they think they got it hidden from their kids. I got bad news for you. Your kids are going to find out. And uh, the Bible speaks about a little bird telling them, you know. Uh, they're they're going to they're discover these things, and they're going to lose respect in you. You ever see a child who's been, uh, who, who, who's just greatly disappointed to find out that their daddy is uh, maybe a crook or something like that. Uh, the, the, the grief that that child may not ever say or express or anything like that, but you know it hurts. You know it hurts. Uh, so uh, be a good example. Be, be a good example that they can follow. Now, it's, it's good that we need to understand that sometimes as parents, we're not We've got a messed up life. Remember David and Bathsheba? Solomon's mom and dad, guess who they were? David and Bathsheba, did they do everything right? David was a liar. He was a thief. He took another man's wife. He was uh, an adulterer. He was a murderer. I mean, he did everything that was wrong. He was a man after God's own heart. I kind of wonder, maybe, possibly, uh, whether things would have been a whole lot different in his life if he had done things right when he could have, uh, when he did things wrong. 
Uh, what would have been different, you know? Well, Uriah the Hittite wouldn't have lost his wife. He'd have been alive and so forth like that. Uh, maybe Solomon wouldn't have even been born, you know? But what I'm trying to tell you is that God's grace is bigger than our sins, and he still used them. And, uh, uh, but I, I think that, uh, that, Re uh, that uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, uh, was probably a product in a lot of ways of some of the things that David did. Uh, he was, he's the granddaddy. David's the granddaddy of Rehoboam. Uh, he heard and knew and so forth uh, the things that were going on. And maybe, oh yeah, you're, uh, you're the one that stole uh, Uriah's wife and so forth, brought a reproach on the nation of Israel and so forth. Uh, I don't think that set very good with, with either Solomon or with Rehoboam in time. Now, even uh, what I'm trying to say here, I guess, is this is that even if our children don't have the best parents, they still need to honor their parents. And that's what Solomon was doing. Solomon was, was a mess, but, uh, I mean, uh, David was a mess, but Solomon honored his father and his mother, his mother, Bathsheba. We don't see really much said about her, uh, but we do know that she was a party to that adulterous uh, uh, relationship. Then, then she married him, you know, it doesn't get much uglier than that, you know. Uh, here's the thing. We need to be good examples. And then secondly, uh, it's a commandment for us to honor the Lord. And I've kind of already gotten into this because I got ahead of myself. I usually find some time in a, a lesson to do something like that. But again, the idea is that it's the fifth commandment. We need to, it's a commandment. We don't have an option. Now, here's, here's what we want. We want to live a long life. If you want to, you know, who was it spent a lot of time looking for the fountain of youth, you know, and so forth like this? Who was it? Ponce de Leola. Ponce de Leola. Okay. I guess I didn't know that name, but anyway, it sounds good. And uh, he was uh, looking for the fountain of youth. Uh, did he ever find it? No. But here's where the real fountain of youth is, or at least of long life. Obeying your parents. Want to live a long time? Do right. You say, well, preacher, I know kids that obeyed their parents, and they... They died young. Yeah, but they died probably in a life where they had more quality in their life. Uh, dying young than somebody living 75 or 80 years old would have. Uh, I've known some people. I, I almost think sometimes long life to a wicked person is almost like a punishment, you know. But uh, needless to say, he, he says it, it's a, it is a commandment. And uh, if you want to know what the fountain of youth is, well, just uh, obey your parents. And certainly another thing about uh, not obeying your parents, you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit if you don't obey your parents. Over in Ephesians 5, verse 18 through chapter 6 and verse uh, 4, it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, he addresses the wife and the husband and then the, the, uh, the children and then the, the uh, employee and the employer, that kind of a relationship there. And uh, the relationship is drawn. I don't know about you, but I need God's Spirit in my life like nobody's business. And part of me getting that Spirit in my life is, well, it kind of goes down to this. I've got to obey my parents. Got to do that. Uh, he starts off there in verse 8. He says, my son, again, verse 10, verse uh, 15, all say, my, my son. And, uh, and, but each of those times that he says, my son, there is a commandment that follows it. Notice what it says. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Down there in verse uh, 10. Uh, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Verse 15. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Uh, so he, he addresses them. And, and uh, this term again is used some 23 times in the book of Proverbs uh, alone. But he goes on, he says, Hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Yeah, mom has a law. <laughs> you know, there are certain things that uh, mom says kids have to do and so forth, you know. Make your bed, or, uh, wash your dishes, or, you know, don't embarrass me out in the public, or a hundred other things that could be uh, mentioned. In the Bible, you'll notice that the mothers of all the kings of Judah, maybe not all of them, but nearly all of them, the mothers of all the kings of Judah are listed. They're named. They're, they're shown up there. And, I don't know whether that's so that they can get the credit or get the blame. I'm not sure uh, for the way their, their sons conducted themselves while they were kings. But uh, 
I do believe this much that it kind of says, you got to get a lot of your character from your mother. So I tell you what, you, you need to love and honor and uh, brag on mom and appreciate her and, and help her and, and don't let her uh, do it all by herself. And one of the other siblings says something unkind, you jump to her defense. Uh, that's, uh, that is a, a good thing to do. Uh, so it says you're to hear the instruction of the mother. And then it says, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck there in verse 9. Now, you know what an ornament is. You know, we put ornaments on trees. But sometimes, ladies, when we think about ornaments, we think, we think about jewelry and, uh, I don't know, whatever else. And, and uh, sometimes the ladies will put the pretty earrings on their on their ears. I don't. I never have gotten over the rings in the nose. That hasn't ever rung my bell at all. Uh, I, I've always wanted to just run around with a little clip and grab it and hook on it and follow me, you know. But uh, I'm I'm just uh, putting that out. But uh, 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 there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't do that, I guess. But but it, it just it's an ornament. Now you want to have the right ornaments, the ornament of grace. Uh, and uh, have you ever seen somebody that? Well, they're, they're, they've got jewelry on, and so, boy, they just look classy first, you know, right up the line. You just say, wow, that person knows how to, how to uh, dress and present herself and so forth like this. And, uh, but here's, here's uh, the thing. Young people, a lot of times, they like to have nice things, nice jewels and, and uh, ornament. They put ornaments on their body or in their body or however they do that. But uh, here's the greatest ornament that a person can do. That ornament is to deck yourself with the ornament of honoring your parents. We're still talking about honoring parents. Seems like a lot, a lot to build on that thing. But if a child will, will uh, uh, well, let me put it this way. Have you ever seen somebody, a, a dad and a mom or somebody uh, that uh, uh, they were, uh, they were uh, good Parents and their children obeyed them. Down in uh, uh, La Plata, uh, there's a family, they're the Weaver family. They've been here, they, you've heard them sing and play uh, their instruments and cellos and all that stuff. And, and uh, I, every time I see them, I, I, I marvel at uh, how those kids honor their parents and do what the parents say and so forth. And, and uh, dad was a captain in the Navy and so forth. Mom was... I think she was also in the Navy at some time, but they just raised their kids. They taught them at home. They're all so, uh, the, well, homeschooled and uh, all that. Now they're all grown up and they're starting to go off to college now. And there's not many of them left at home, I guess. So, but uh, when I saw them, I said, wow, what a, what a honorable family. Uh, what, what would you say that was? Would you say that that would be an ornament, the way they dressed? And the way they carried themselves about, and when they obeyed uh, their parents and so forth, I, boy, I just can't think of anything that was any nicer than that. So he's, so he speaks about this ornament of grace, and uh, you know, it makes the parents shine brighter when the kids obey the parents. You know, it makes. I, am I doing something here? I'm hearing myself here. Let's see if we can't get the noise down. Uh, it's. It, it, it's uh, it's, it's a great honor to see a, a child who honors his uh, parents. You say, how do they do that? Well, mom says, uh, go do this or do that. And they say, yes, ma'am. Thank you, mom. Uh, mom, is there anything else you want me to do? Would you like me to wash the dishes? Uh, that, that almost sounds spooky to hear kids say something like that, right? But it's, uh, uh, it's an honor. It's, what are you doing? You're honoring your parents. Uh, Mom says, I want you to uh, vacuum the house and so forth. You don't sit around there and say, oh, I, I did it last time. Let them do it. You know, That's not honoring your parents. You, see? you do what they tell you to do, and, and uh, you, you present yourself as, as a ornament. Boy, other parents say, boy, I wish my kids were like that. You ever hear somebody say that? That's the ornament I'm talking about. An ornament is a decoration. And it, it kind of makes, I think it makes them shine. It makes them shine. Well, let's go down here. Any questions on that section? I don't mean to be doing all the speaking, but if you got a comment or something you'd like to add in there, you're certainly welcome to throw in your two bits worth. Anybody? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's slip down to verse 10. He says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Now, 
Here we're going to speak about, this is the title of the message, Running with the Right Crowd. Run with the right crowd. Boy, son, it doesn't take much to get kids off base. He said, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up, alive as the grave, and, and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall... Fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk thou, uh, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Uh, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately uh, with their own lives. So are they. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Now, uh, here's here, here's the thing about this. Uh, he he's saying, I want you. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I think every one of us is, that's parents had that fear of the wrong person influencing one of our children. Am I right? And uh, and a lot of times we, we it happens. Uh, maybe right under our nose, we they watch the wrong television show, or they, they, uh, you know, have you ever heard a kid say something and they said, where'd they get that? You know, you, you, you know, they say something off color, and you say, you can't say that anymore, and you, you know, there's a, there's a, a consequence for that. But uh, here's here's what he he's telling us there. We need to be careful. Uh, how we relate to the wrong crowd. The wrong crowd's out there. We've got to live with them. We've got to deal with them and so forth, but we don't have to necessarily hobnob with them. Okay? Uh, it, it's sad, but the average Christian's relationship to the unbelieving world is almost that of open arms. Come on in, you know? And uh, I understand a little bit of that. As a pastor, I've got to relate to a lot of people, uh, but there are some people that I'm a, a lot closer to than other people just simply because of the, the context there that uh, we have. Uh, and so uh, we think about the open arms. There's, there's King Solomon. He had open arms, didn't he? He just kind of opened his arms up and said, okay, come on in. You know, he didn't do what he told him. He, he let his, wife, his wives lead him astray, and he went into idolatry and built temples for some of the uh, gods and goddesses that his wives wanted to, to have. And, and uh, the Bible says we're not to have any kind of a, a relationship with them. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 through 17, it says, uh, Be not un unequally yoked together with unbelievers, you know, for what concord has light with darkness. You know, he compares that. He says light and darkness can't get along with each other, and neither can the Christian get along with that which is evil. Uh, he's, and the idea of being yoked is that you, you're even. You know, you, you have people that are like you. You, you, you put a, you, you've seen horses that are yoked together to pull a cart or something like that. Or, and uh, they, you got equal horses. This horse is as big as this horse and as strong as this horse. And so they, they have a, a capability of working together. Now, you don't put a horse with a mule. That doesn't work. You know what they do? They sit there and kick each other and so forth. And guess what happens to the cart? It doesn't go very far. You know, it doesn't get anywhere. Uh, I, was, I like to watch these uh, stories about uh, up in Alaska where they have the uh, below zero thing. I forgot what they actually call it. But they have people up there that train dogs to pull sleds. And those dogs have got to be equally matched or the sled doesn't go anywhere. Of course, you have a lead dog and all that stuff, but they've got to be yoked together, right? I see people, unbelievers and believers, don't yoke very good. They have different value systems and so forth. That's why I think it's so wrong for an unbeliever to marry a believer. You know why? Because they don't share the same values. I think that every man or every woman ought to share those values. If if a, a, if a now, sometimes you've got people that get saved, one gets saved, one doesn't in the marriage. But to set yourself up and say, well, I'm just going to win them to the Lord myself, it doesn't work that way. But uh, what happens is when, a, uh, when, let's just say, one person, the wife comes home, she ought to be able to say, you can't believe what went on in church. Guess what the unbeliever is going to do? He said, I don't want to hear about it. She can't really, they can't really be one the way they need to be one. 
And so uh, this, this is a, an issue here. I, I feel like I'm getting roped. So is this uh, bothering anybody? Like it's bothering me. I hear myself. Uh, so uh, he, here in verse 10, uh, he's, he's, sinners basically kind of see them full of venom. I said, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And I kind of get this idea of Adam and Eve. There, there's Eve in the garden. There's a snake coming up there, and that venom is, is uh, being poured out. And she said, uh, he, he said, uh, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? You know? And uh, he said, if you eat of this, you'll be like gods, and, and uh, you'll know everything. And God's trying to keep things from you, so you need to do this. And so here's, a, here's a Satan trying to entice uh, at, uh, Eve in the garden. And, uh, and uh, you, you kind of get the idea that, that uh, uh, I mean, the person kind of gets the idea that they'll advance themselves if they get into the sin and so forth, and they'll know things that they didn't know before. It doesn't work that way. Verse 11 says, If they say, Come with us, let us lay in wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocents without cause. Now, that is not really what people say. Uh, they, they use some... some uh, subtlety in the whole thing and say things, but this is telling us what is really happening. He says this, when they're asking you to do these things, they may not say this, but this is what the truth of the matter is. And so he's saying, uh, he's saying this, have you ever seen a lot of people wonder, how did you get into that gang? You know, how did you get into that gang or something like that? And uh, while these words are, uh, uh, they, they didn't get into those, get into that gang because, oh, I'm, I want to be mean. And so they, they got enticed into that. A lot of things. Uh, the seducer kind of, uh, he, he kind of comes in there and he says, uh, uh, I'm going to, he, he covers up the real intents of everything of him going in that thing. And uh, he, he gets in it. It's kind of like this. Uh, if, a, if a drunkard, if a drunkard uh, comes along and he, he says, uh, oh, come on in here, we'll have a good time and so forth like this. And he gets into the, uh, he says, you're going to have cheerfulness and so forth, and we're going to have a good time. And uh, so he, he gives them all these different reasons why he ought to drink and carry on that stuff. Uh, what happens is, is uh, he gets to a point where he, he gets out of his own mind. He doesn't even realize that this is a trap in a certain way. Uh, same thing with uh, you know nicotine or drugs or anything like that. Uh, and here's what they say, I never thought I'd end up this way. I never thought I'd end up this way. Uh, somebody was harmed or murdered. Uh, somebody would say, nobody was supposed to get hurt. You ever hear somebody say that? You know, and, uh, uh, nobody was supposed to get hurt. Uh, verse 11 just kind of shows the, the end of, a truth, of the truth of what somebody's crime is, uh, is and not what it started out to be if they entice you. Have you ever made a decision you wish you'd never made? You know, you got enticed to... Maybe a, maybe somebody talked you into buying something. You, it wasn't of any value to you and, and so forth. And you thought it was going to be great and so forth. And then uh, you got it and you said, man, I, this is dumb. This is not, this is not what it should be. And so uh, they, they do that. So he speaks about let us lurk privately or privily for the innocent without cause. In other words, they, they're going to hurt somebody. Somebody's going to get injured in this whole thing. Uh, boy, uh, that's not good. And this specifically, if you look at the next verse, he says, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as the, those that go down into the pit. Uh, here's what he's doing. is he's, promise, he, he's talking about murder, really. Swallow them up. And, uh, murder happens because people convince themselves that they can get away with it. I can get away with this. Or stealing or any number of other things. And they can cover it up just like the grave covers up the bodies of the dead that are mentioned here in this verse. How did Jesus handle this problem when he was tempted by Satan? You think about that. Jesus was tempted by the devil, wasn't he? And uh, how did he handle that when he's out there in the wilderness? Satan tried to make Jesus see that he'd have all these advantages. Uh, you bow down to me and you'll, uh, you'll have this kingdom. And so uh, he, he tried to give him all these advantages and and uh, all he had to do is comply to whatever Satan's uh, persuasions were. Uh, Jesus, I think, of course, he's God. He, he can see the long-range outcome of the whole thing. 
and uh, so forth. And yet this was a real temptation, so much so that uh, angels came to minister to, to, David, to uh, Jesus after he had gone through that temptation. It was a difficult and trying time uh, for him. And, uh, but I think he could see down the road, he said, if I do this, this is what's going to happen. One of the things going to happen is you and I aren't going to be able to be saved. I'm glad he overcame the temptation. The temptations, he wasn't going to fall because he's God, but, but he had to go through that so that we would know that he had the power to go through it and that we could uh, be delivered. Well, I'm not going to get this done, am I? Uh, he says in verse 14, Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Uh, a person of misfortune is, is left alone in life. Uh, he get, he's, the, he's easy prey. He's somebody that they're going to try to bring into the, the, uh, uh, the life of whatever he wants to be, whatever they want to try to bring him into. Why? Because he's alone. And they have this thing that says, man, you get into this gang or you get in with us or something like this, and you're kind of like family then. Everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to belong. And so uh, uh, deep down, you know, have you ever noticed some people can be alone in a crowd, you know? And uh, this is kind of where he is. And so you look at this. And this basically was what verse 14 is saying, almost like the thought of communism. Uh, you don't you don't want to be a part of that. Cast in thy lot among us, and let us all have one purse. And then he goes on. I've I've, I've got so much here. I'm I'm afraid I'm not going to get this done. I thought I could get through this point. What I, let me just tell you the gist of what's going to happen here. I'm telling he he tells you what uh, you are to avoid, the crowd you're to avoid, and then in verse 20 and 22, we'll not get to that tonight. We'll get to that next time. Uh, we need to create the right crowd. In other words, we know what the wrong crowd is, but God made us social. He wants us to interact with people and so forth. And so he gives us this right crowd. And so he says, uh, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse in the uh, openings of the gates in the city. She uttereth her words. Remember I said it was personify. Say, how long? Ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. And, and so uh, he tells us to repent, and he tells us to do a number of things that well, I don't have time to get into. But uh, read these things out. I hope this is a blessing to you. I, it's, it's, uh, this is good stuff, I think. And you're going to find that there's some repentance that's involved in that and, and so many things. I, Proverbs is a fascinating book. I hope you take time to read it. And let me just shoot ahead. If you're going to keep coming, I hope you will. Uh, shoot ahead and see what you come up with. Maybe get a pencil and say, well, this is what this verse means to me and so forth. And and Because uh, I like to have the, you know, the interaction there a little bit. Okay, any questions about anything I've said? Or comments? Brother Ben, do you know anything that I don't know? <laughs> All right, well, uh, he, he's good. Well, I, I need to mark a spot here so I know where I got to get back in here. Okay. All right. I trust that this will be a blessing to you. Well, let's uh, go ahead and have uh, our time of prayer. Let's see, is this the month I got this next? No, I got one more week. And then we'll be doing a new prayer list uh, for the month of March. Uh, let's, we've got a lot of people to pray for. And uh, I certainly uh, want to particularly be praying. By the way, do we need to take up an offering? We do? Okay. Brother Ben, come on up here and you can do that while I'm talking, okay? Uh, we, uh, uh, we're going to have our, uh, we've got prayer requests. And certainly the, the, uh, for the family of uh, the Adolphs. We're going to have a funeral here at this church this coming Monday, I believe, at 11 o'clock. And uh, there's going to be a viewing at the uh, Hardesty Funeral Home in Galesville, and that's going to be from 2 to 4. Is that it? 7 to 9. So you can come to church and race out of here after church Sunday night. <laughs> we'll be done at 7. So, But... Uh, 
uh, we, we encourage you to be a support to Sandy and her family. But the service will be here, and uh, I think we're going to be able to broadcast it. But that, uh, I'm not sure. I think my wife will be able to do that. She'll be here at 11, so uh, if you want to watch online. Uh, and so uh, pray about that, that God would be on Yes, sir. It'd be 11 o'clock. Okay, 11 o'clock on Monday. And, of course, uh, viewing on Sunday after church both times. 2 to 4 and 7 to 9. Is it just 9 o'clock? Okay, so at the Hardesty Funeral Home. Uh, we have, uh, my goodness, I look down here and I, I'm seeing a lot of people that we need to pray for. West Morgan has two funerals today. In fact, I heard something, but I haven't been able to get him to... Uh, correspond with me on some of the things that I've heard uh, but his brother-in-law died and of course they're, they're talking about maybe having a joint funeral I've not had one of them before uh, so uh, pray pray about that his brother-in-law died as well as his wife it would be his wife's brother that died and that was Larry Clark and then Shelba Morgan and of course keep praying for the family of Phoebe Edwards and uh Pray for Pam Gray. She's up in, she's a pastor's wife, and she has really been fighting the battle. And, and uh, the doctor, who's a Muslim doctor, I think, came, told the preacher, he said, you need to put her into hospice. And that's how bad it's gotten. She's had that COVID pneumonia and so forth. And uh, she is struggling. She's been in and out of the hospital five or six times now. And, and she goes back with a fever. And, and uh, she's on uh, oxygen and so forth. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got, uh, I'm skipping over a bunch of the Crystal Seibel has uh, MS. And Lavana asked us to pray for John Harrison. How's he doing? Any news on him? He's home on oxygen. He's home on oxygen. Okay. So uh, keep them in your prayers. And... Uh, uh, and uh, I know that that would be appreciated. Uh, Lisa Loy's mother uh, passed away, and so there's another one for us to hold up in prayer. And I know that there's uh, uh, also the Buck family uh, with his grandmother that I do not know who or what her name is. But if you would pray for uh, pray for them, uh, this is this is really a, a tough time. You know, we went through all that COVID stuff, and I thought I'd probably get waylaid with a bunch of funerals, and I think I might have only had two or three funerals in a year's time. Often I'd have uh, maybe nine to 12 funerals in a year's time, and, and boy, it just seems like I just about got that many done, and it's not even been three months yet. So so uh, just pray, pray for our people, and uh, I know that they would appreciate it. Uh, is there anything else that we need to mention in prayer? Anybody? How are you feeling, Miss Betty? She's here tonight. Boy, thank you for being here. What a tremendous blessing. Uh, and we've got people that probably could have every excuse in the world to stay home, and they're here tonight. I, I appreciate your faithfulness. Jesus said, will he find faith on the earth when he comes? Boy, I think so, if Betty's around. <laughs> she, here she is. I appreciate her so much. Thank you. She can't drive much at night. How are we going to get you home tonight? I don't know how bad it is. Did she? Did Did Sandy bring you? I said Sandy's been gone. Surely gone. Well, amen. Well, maybe we get Brother Ben to follow you home or something. Where was this at, or should we ask? Oh, my. Okay. All right. Some of our people that want to come ought to be able to come, and it's really kind of up to the rest of us to make sure they can. You know, uh, I'm, 
I'm getting a little bit older myself, you know, and this, I, I, it's hard to believe. I know that you're sitting there saying, oh, yeah, that's what you're doing, right? But, uh, and, uh, but uh, needless to say, some of us can't do things. My wife has laid down the law to me. She says, you're not getting back on top of that roof over there to nail down shingles that keep blowing away. I need people to do that. And uh, we really, there's a lot of things like that that we need to do. So you youngins, you guys that are younger than I am anyway, uh, get on the stick, amen, and help us out. Some of you have, by the way. Well, I'm happy to let them have all the blessings they want. I'll be honest with you. Amen. <laughs> she said, if I keep doing it, I'm, miss, I'm keeping people from the blessings. Uh, well, uh, anyway, I, I appreciate those that have gotten up there and helped us out. And there's other things. Uh, some have come by and picked up sticks and taken them out in the woods. You know, these trees, uh, they got dandruff. They keep dropping all this all this, mon this mess on the, on the grounds and I hate it. It drives me insane. I just, I don't like seeing brush laid on the church property. I think our property ought to be pristine and so forth. And while it's not pristine all the time, it doesn't have to look junky either. Amen. All right. Anything else? Brother Ben, how about you coming up here and doing this? You got your microphone? Okay. And uh, be with us this Sunday at 945 for Sunday school. Lord willing, I'll be teaching out of the book of Mark. I think I'm, I forgot what chapter now, chapter 10 or something like that. And uh, I can give you that information here uh, shortly. I just can't remember where it was. But uh, come on in here and be with us. And of course, uh, church on Sunday morning and Sunday night at 6 o'clock. And then of course, we've got the funeral on uh, at 11 o'clock on Monday. And uh, then we've got uh, our Wednesday night church again one uh, one week from now be seven o'clock all right say what you'd like and then lead us i can do that i don't have everybody on it saved and put his faith in you and uh, Lord I pray that you would give much peace and comfort and grace to Sandy and her family. And Amen. I pray that through the funeral uh, Lord somebody would come to Christ that somebody would put their faith in you and, and know that uh, they want to be where Wayne is. They want to be able to spend forever and, and never have to say goodbye again with uh, loved ones who have also placed their faith in you. Lord, I pray that all would go well. I pray for the funeral home that they would do uh, a, a top-notch job, that they would really uh, do honor by it all family. And Lord, I pray that they would be very pleased with what they see and experience up there. And, and Lord, I, I pray for pastors as well, just that you give them incredible wisdom and strength, um, just the, the hand of God on him as he speaks on Monday and, and really as he provides any counsel that he can for any person. Lord, for our church as well, just as we interact with people at the viewings and uh, Lord in the community uh, throughout our week at the funeral and here at church. And Lord, I pray that we see people that might not have otherwise come, come through church uh, because of the, the, of the viewings and the funeral and all that happens. And Lord, I pray a testimony would really shine bright. Amen.
Well, again, we thank you for watching. And you know how to turn that thing off back there? Okay, you can get that thing turned off so we don't <laughs> mess up. We do have our uh, ministry meeting this Sunday night at 7 o'clock after the service. Every member really ought to be here for that. So come on out and support your church and uh, know what's going on, okay? God's best to you. We love you. We can help you. Please feel free to call us. And uh, we trust we trust we'll meet the needs. God's best.